Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. And I'm very privileged to have back Professor Dale Martin of Yale University, who has been teaching or has taught there for several decades, perhaps even 30 years. And uh, he has been on several times before. And today we're very, very fortunate indeed. Uh, Dale has come back to talk about the historical Jesus, uh, what we can know about this person uh, historically, um, uh, what are the sources, what are the methodologies that historians use to uh, discover the historical facts about Jesus of Nazareth. So um, by way of just um, opening this up further, Dale, if I may, I'm going to quote a sentence from uh, your book, uh, which is entitled New Testament History and Literature. And you write there on page 180, the New Testament is simply not a reliable source for the history of Jesus or early Christianity when taken at face value. So page 180. So that's a quite a provocative statement for many people, I think, to hear. C could you perhaps explain um, in more detail why this is the case for you as an historian? and how historians can discover the historical facts about Jesus, if at all. The, the case for why the New Testament is not reliable as a straightforward historical source is simply that it contradicts itself too much. Uh, you can go with um, tons of examples. One of the most glaring is that according to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus is born in Bethlehem because that's where his hometown is. His parents just live there. That's Mary, uh, Mary's hometown. And uh, he's born uh, in a regular kind of place. Um, according to Luke, his family resides in Galilee. That's their home area. And they go down to Bethlehem in order to register for a census. Um, now, the very fact that Luke makes up this Roman census is historically important because it never happened. There's no record anywhere else in the world of uh, the Romans commanding everybody to go back to a hometown to be counted in a census, much less a hometown that their ancestors hadn't lived in for a thousand years. Uh, mm -hmm. Luke says they went back to Bethlehem because that was David's town. Jesus is the son of David. Well, David mm -hmm. ruled in around 1000 BCE. So, uh, it, I, one thing I ask my students all the time, I say, if you, in order to enroll for a United States a census, if you had to go back to where one of your ancestors lived a thousand years ago, where would you go? And of course, they don't know uh, most of the time, and they might pick one ancestor, but it might not be the ancestor that the Romans wanted or something like that. So um, Luke and Matthew both have Jesus born in Bethlehem. But they get him there in entirely different ways. And then, of course, you have many other differences. In Luke, you have shepherds. In Matthew, you don't have shepherds. You have kings uh, bearing gifts. Uh, you have, uh, you know, you have the slaughter of the innocents by King Herod in Matthew. No mention of that in Luke at all. And then if you go to Mark and John, they seem to simply assume that Jesus is from Galilee. They don't make any bones about uh, trying to get him to Bethlehem. So getting his family to Bethlehem in some way by Matthew and Luke uh, is clear from even the way they introduce it. They say in order to fulfill prophecy. Yeah. So they're saying Jesus was born in Bethlehem because that's what they believe the Hebrew scriptures prophesy. Uh, that's just one instance. Uh, the trial of Jesus is also very different in the four different uh, canonical gospels. Uh, different things happen in, in the trial. Uh, different things happen in different order. Um, and so you, it, the other thing is it's clear from even their own narratives that the disciples of Jesus weren't present at his trial. And the Romans would not have brought them in. They didn't have like a gallery where... Well, why would that have been, Dale? Why would um, lower class Galilean peasants not have been permitted to enter into a trial, assuming it even took place? Well, what, well, the one thing, it, it didn't happen in a public court, as we imagine today. It happened in the private offices of Pilate. Um, and so, you know, you, you can't just walk in the offices of Pilate mm. uh, at the time. Not even high class Jews would have been able to do so unless they were very close to Pilate. But certainly a bunch of ragtag fishermen from uh, Galilee could not have attended the trial of Jesus. 
And, he, and then they even say that when Jesus was arrested, they all scattered. Right. And some of the Gospels try to have the women uh, close to Jesus. Uh, the Gospel of John tries to have Peter in the garden of Pilate. Uh, so maybe he could have overheard something. But mm -hmm. this is these are clearly made up uh, stories meant to illustrate uh, how the disciples could quote what Pilate said and what Jesus said at this trial. Mm -hmm. But even then, they don't quote it the same. The four Gospels have, you know, some of the Gospels have Jesus, like the Gospel of Mark, has Jesus being completely numb, uh, dumb, no talking at all, basically, except for one statement or so. But in the Gospel of John, he carries on a, you know, chapter long conversation with Pilate about what is the nature of truth. Yeah. Um, he sounds, sounds like a philosopher, you know, instructing one of his students. So nobody knew what happened at the trial of Jesus except Pilate. Um, and he wasn't talking uh, in the first century about this. Uh, so, uh, of course, then we even have uh, pseudonymous writings that are in, written in the name of Pilate, and he it wasn't they weren't by Pilate. They were written much later by Christians, and they they kind of give what Pilate's version would have been of the trial mm. and how he regretted doing it. He had, then he was visited by nightmares, and then he finally confessed Jesus and became a Christian himself. And in some Christian churches, you had therefore Saint Pilate. Uh, you had Pilate becoming a Christian saint. But these, this happened centuries yeah. after the first century. So well, I, don't get, I don't get that. Is why was there a trial anyway? Because were the Romans typically in the habit of having public courts and trials of, you know, uh, outlaws and peasants, you know, who were not Roman citizens? Uh, no. I mean, did they believe in the American due process? But was ancient Rome like America today? No, the Romans would have not would have needed no trial, and they almost never did when they crucified someone. You, you know, the army simply captured uh, what they called brigands. Um, Latronis or something like that in the Latin. And these were, they just said, these are kind of robber uh, people. They're, re they're rebels. Yeah, they're rebelling against Roman power, but they're doing it mainly for money. They're just trying to steal from people. And, right. and so the Romans would just send out, you know, a, ca a cavalry or a group of soldiers and then just grab somebody or a group of people. The Romans were known for crucifying hundreds of people at a time. Without um, trial, presumably without trial. This was, no, right. so there would be no reason to have a, a trial. It had been historically extremely implausible anyway to have a trial of Jesus, given who he was uh, anyway. It's not like standard That's procedure. Right. Yeah. But there are lots and lots of other examples that are just glaringly obvious to a historian. For example, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who all, uh, Matthew and Luke knew the Gospel of Mark, and they fashioned their Gospels on the Gospel of Mark. Mm -hmm. And Mark and Matthew and Luke, therefore, all have Jesus spend basically his entire ministry in Galilee. And he only travels to Jerusalem the last week of his life, mm -hmm. with famously the Palm Sunday happening a week before Easter Sunday, uh, because that's when supposedly Jesus entered Jerusalem and the people waved their palms. It's not that way at all in the Gospel of John. No, the Gospel of John has Jesus going back and forth from Galilee to Jerusalem, back to Galilee to Jerusalem, uh, starting with chapter four of uh, the Gospel of John. So, you know, which do you believe? You can't, you can't believe both of them are historically accurate data. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you get around to saying, okay, what do we believe about where most of Jesus's ministry took place? Most of us uh, critical scholars would say, well, it took place in Galilee. Uh, and yet he was crucified, uh, we believe. Um, and probably in Rome, right outside the city of Rome. So somehow he went to Rome, and then we have to explain why did he go to Rome right toward the end of what was going to be the end of his life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are the his, the, uh, the the sources that historians do use? Uh, I mean, are, are there any reliable sources at all? Or do they, um, how do they go about the business of investigating historical Jesus? This has been controversial recently because... Uh, some people have tried to make a big case and it gets some kind of sensation in the press, you know, in the New York Times or something like that, when some scholar, and it's usually, it's almost never a, a recognized, reputable historical scholar of religion or the Bible. It's usually somebody who may be a scholar of some other field. Um, and they say, oh, well, we believe now that the newly discovered uh, gospel of Judas um, 
where Jesus has the words, my wife. Uh, and of course, some people made a big deal of that and say, well, Jesus was married. This is evidence that Jesus was married. Uh, some scholars say that the Gospel of Mary or the Gospel of Peter, which we have fragments of, um, which recounts mainly just the death of Jesus and his resurrection in a very striking way. And some scholars have tried to say, oh, you know, these were the Gospels that were suppressed by the church. It was the Holy Roman Catholic Church that's the big villain in a lot of these things. And they say the church yeah. suppressed these Gospels because they knew they had better reliable information about Jesus than did the four Gospels of the Bible. But that, that's really not a defensible historical argument. You can tell just by reading. I, I could read some of these Gospels to my college students who had no background education in historiography or the history of the New Testament. For example, there are letters between um, Jesus and the Roman philosopher Seneca, um, and which they complement each other, or you know, uh, or not, not Seneca, Jesus and King Agbar, the a king at the time. I think it was Paul and Seneca. Was it? Didn't Paul write letters to Seneca? Paul's are the letters to Seneca. Yeah, yeah. So I misspoke there. It was Jesus and and the king who yeah. wrote back and forth. And, you know, the king is saying, I hear of many things of you in the, in the many writings that I read. And then he kind of quotes the Gospel of John as if, you know, the king there uh, living in his kingdom outside of Palestine had a copy of the Gospel of John in front of him. Mm -hmm. um, and my students can even say, oh, whoever wrote this is just quoting from the Bible. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously not an independent historical source from the Bible. So uh, there are a lot of those kinds of things. My position has always been that the most reliable sources we have, in fact, the only reliable sources we have, uh, even though, as I said, they can't be taken straightforwardly as history, but they do have, I think, historical tidbits in them that can be used to construct a historical Jesus are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from the New Testament, the Gospel of Thomas, which I think is probably somewhat independent from those gospels and but it's also not a gospel of the life of jesus it's no. it's a gospel full of sayings it's just, and, it's saying, yeah yeah and so uh, yeah so i think those five gospels are the only gospels that really are usable for historical purposes for the history historical jesus and i would include then the seven authentic uh, letters of paul uh, right. Not all 13 letters of Paul in the New Testament, but the seven of Paul that uh, critical scholars have decided Paul actually wrote. Paul didn't know Jesus uh, in his lifetime. Paul never saw Jesus, except if you believe, like Paul believed, that he saw Jesus in visions, that Jesus appeared to him in visions. But Paul was not hanging around Jesus in his lifetime. But uh, Paul has obviously inherited from other disciples before him some mm -hmm. sayings of Jesus. Yeah. And so, and, and for example, the most obvious is when Paul uh, talks to the Corinthians about the Lord's Supper. And he says, Jesus took the bread and he said this, and then he took the wine and he said this, and I handed on to you these things that I received. That very language about handing on, paradosis in Greek, is... Um, indicates that Paul is referring to what we would call oral tradition. Indeed. And there's also some sayings uh, attributed to Jesus in Paul about divorce and remarriage uh, exactly. or inadmissibility of divorce, except in certain circumstances, for example. Yes. Yeah. The, that's also in 1 Corinthians 7. Mm. So uh, Paul gives us a few places where even though he didn't hear Jesus say these things, he learned about them from a very early period in the history of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So I would say the letters of Paul, um, that is the seven authentic letters of Paul and the five gospels, the four from the canon and Thomas, that's about the only materials that I have been uh, convinced can be used to construct a historical Jesus. Now, these other texts you have mentioned briefly, the gospel of Judas and Mary and so on, th th these are not first century texts, are they? They, they are arguably Judas much, much later. Uh, some of them are from the second century. Um, so I would say they're for mostly from the late second century, right? but we have to remember that the names of our four canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John weren't actually applied to the texts themselves until the late second century. Um, the first evidence we have is Irenaeus, 
who's a Christian bishop writing it around the year 200 or 180. Mm -hmm. uh, so there may be some Christian texts that were written around the time uh, that at least some of the Gospels, the, if the Gospel of Thomas was also written in the second century, which is what I believe, um, and the Gospel of John may have been written around the year 90 or 100, then the earlier Gospels that are in our canon and the Gospel of Thomas predate most of these apocryphal Gospels, but not all of them. Okay, fair enough. So uh, given the contradictions and the historical improbabilities that you've outlined already in the canonical Gospels, uh, how do uh, historians, what methods do they use to decide what is authentic or inauthentic or more likely to be historical and less likely to be historical? What criteria do they use? This has also been something that's been heavily debated in the last 20 years. Hmm. Um, and these criteria were only developed in the 20th century, basically. Over the course of the 20th century, enough scholars came to rely on several different things that they called criteria of historicity. And... Um, but and one of them would be earlier sources are better than later sources. Mm. So if you can link the Gospel of Mark, if you can put the Gospel of Mark at the year 70, which I think we can pretty reliably do, that makes it the earliest gospel. Uh, if you link, if you put Paul's letters around the year 50, that's even earlier because that predates Mark by 20 years, uh, at least. And then... Um, uh, Matthew and Luke may come around the year 80 or 85 with John coming maybe around the year 90, let's say those are rough estimates. And, but that still makes them the earliest gospel sources we have of Jesus and the earliest and with Paul, the earliest sources we have of the sayings and life of Jesus. So earlier sources are better than later sources. Um, that's also why Paul is so important because like I said, his writings are the earliest Christian literature we possess, period, mm -hmm. uh, if they come from right before and right after the year 50. The, the next criterion would be the criterion of multiple attestation. Right. This is the idea that if, if a saying of Jesus um, or similar, very similar sayings of Jesus, because they may not be verbatim, occur in one or more, in, in more than one, um, independent sources, then that has a little bit better chance of being um, historical. What that means is that uh, we believe that Matthew and Luke used Mark. So Mark would be one source. He'd be his own source. Matthew and Luke also used a, a written saying of sources that we have called Q, which is just from the German word Kvel, which is a German word for source. Mm -hmm. And uh, the theory was invented by German scholars. So they get to name the source. Um, and so we talk about the source Q. And that means that when you find a saying in Matthew and Luke, that's verbatim identical, or almost verbatim identical, that doesn't count as two sources that counts as one source, because we think they're both using the same written source. But if you find a, a parable, say, that's in one version in Q, that is quoted by Matthew and Luke, but in a different version in Mark, well, that's two independent sources, Q and Mark. And so you can say, well, that lends a little more probability uh, to the fact that Jesus maybe did actually tell this parable. Um, then you've got the Gospel of John that some people, this is where a lot of these theories have been debated. A lot of people don't believe John is much of an independent source because they believe that John shows clear signs of having known Matthew, Mark and Luke, or at least one or two of them himself. So if you have something like a, a healing, for example, you don't have a lot of sayings of Jesus and John that exactly match what we find in Matthew, Mark and Luke, but you have a few and then you, but you do have some miracles that look remarkably alike. And um, so some people would say, if you have something in Mark and Q and a similar uh, event in John, that's three sources. Mm. So, and then the gospel of Thomas, of course, would be another uh, independent source. Again, some people would say that Thomas knew the Gospels in the canon, or at least knew some of them. So some people would say Thomas doesn't count as an independent source. I think there's just not enough evidence to establish that. In order to establish dependence of one writer on another's text, I think you have to establish very close um, identical uh, words and language and details. And I just don't believe we have that. So that's why I would say if you 
if you have a saying or an event that's in multiple independent sources, those mm -hmm. independent sources being Mark, Q, and then Matthew and Luke can each count as an independent source as long as they're not using Q or Mark in common, because obviously Matthew has some material that's only, it's unique to Matthew. Luke has some material unique to Luke, but some, and so the verbatim won't count there, but maybe the event will. So for example, all of these sources agree that the Romans executed Jesus and they were the primary responsibility for executing Jesus. They also agree pretty much, not completely, but that he was probably executed on a Friday and buried then. Uh, and they were, they all pretty much agree also that he was, that the charge for him was treason against the Romans. He was executed as a rebel against Roman power. So there are places where we have all of these different sources. Um, the, again, as I said, the Last Supper, uh, it's, it's almost certain that Jesus did have some kind of Last Supper with his disciples, and he said certain things about doing things in his memory. Now, I don't think that was supposed to be a, an establishment of the Eucharist, for example, for the church. That was a later development. But I do think that he could have had some sort of a memorial meal uh, with his disciples because he was suspecting that he was going to be arrested and killed. Mm -hmm. um, that's in Paul. It's in all four Gospels, that sort of thing. Um, and there are several examples like that where, uh, for example, one of the things is that did Jesus, the historical Jesus actually choose 12 of his disciples to be an especially close circle of disciples. Mm. And that's also in all of the uh, sources that we have, even in Paul. Paul claims like he never didn't meet most of them. He says he met Peter and he says he met James, the brother of Jesus. Yeah. But um, James, the brother of Jesus, was not one of those 12. No, strange. But he, he's a head of the church, and he, he wasn't one of the 12. I, he's the head of the church in Jerusalem, yes. In Jerusalem, no. And probably on the basis of him being Jesus' brother. Yeah, like a dynasty. Dynasty. Yeah. Uh, there, there are other criteria, like the, the I quite like the criteria of, uh, for what a better expression, anachronism. The idea that historians, when they spot anachronism, i.e. things that shouldn't really be attributed to that early period, but nevertheless a claim to be of it. For example, in Matthew, um, Jesus founds the church. You know, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The great, the great passage that the Catholic Roman Catholic Church looks to. Um, but you say in your book that this is clearly anachronistic, that Jesus didn't found a church. In fact, he spoke about the kingdom of God uh, in, in the early writings. But what, what, why, why is it anachronistic? What, why couldn't he have spoken of the church, uh, founding the church? Well, you kind of have to get to it by a roundabout, a roundabout way. And this would get into what we think the historical Jesus actually tried to do. And one of my arguments, if you, if you take the evidence that seems to be the best evidence, Jesus did not intend to found an ongoing institution after his death. He didn't, Jesus did not come to, to found a new religion. Right. Um, he was a, a Jewish apocalyptic prophet who was trying to get the Jews ready for the coming of the kingdom of God. Yeah. And by kingdom of God, we don't mean the church. We mean a kingdom on earth in which either Jesus, if he was to be the Messiah or some future coming Messiah would rule over under God. And that would be a, a political, actual political, earthly establishment um, like ancient Israel was. Like David, a king like David, perhaps. A king like David, exactly. And so, but, so that's one thing. The other thing is that in those past, Matthew is the only one who uses that term, establishing the church, and he uses the Greek term, ecclesia. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't speak Greek um, by all evidence. He may have been able to understand a word or two here or there, mm. but it's almost certain that he was not educated enough to speak Greek, and he, Greek was not his primary language. Hebrew and Aramaic, if you want to, sometimes pe ancient people will sometimes be talking about what we would call Aramaic, which is a very kindred language to Hebrew, and they'll call it Hebrew in ancient sources. Right. Right. So it's hard to figure out when they, the ancient writer thinks he's talking about what we would call classical Hebrew, or what uh, we would call classical Aramaic. Aramaic was the dominant language of the Syrian and the Assyrian empires. And that's why it was the dominant language of Palestine 
at the time of Jesus, because uh, Syria was the dominant country at the time for that part of the Roman world. Uh, so why would Jesus have used this term, ecclesia, which is a very specific term. It was used for the Athenian assembly of the citizens. And it means called out because a herald would go through the city in Athens and call out all the citizens of Athens to come to the theater for a, a town council. Now, of course, all the citizens in Athens only referred to male citizens who were descended from Athenian uh, citizens themselves. So it didn't include slaves, it didn't include women, and it didn't include foreigners. But the ecclesia was an official sort of formal term for this town council. Now, it's unclear why the early Christian house churches themselves, and we can see this already in Paul, uh, so it predates Matthew, they chose this term ecclesia, among others, uh, to refer to their own groups. That's kind of an odd choice in itself, but it would be really anachronistic to take that Greek development in Christianity and transfer it back into around the year 30 in Palestine. Mm. It just seems anachronistic. Another another example you give in your book is the 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 I am's as they're called in the Gospel of John, where Jesus uh, appears to say, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." Before Abraham was, "I am." I am the resurrect. These I am statements. You, you say that that would be anachronistic because a a, a Jew, a Palestinian living in the thirties, um, would not have taken on him on his lips the divine name. That would have been that was a, a later. Christological development, but not attributable to the historical Jesus at that early stage. Um, could you perhaps elaborate on, on why that is the case and why the Go Gospel of John is anachronistically attributing Jesus language he wouldn't have used? Well, it, it would be wrong to take me as saying that no Jew of Jesus's day would have claimed some kind of divine status. But we also have to remember in the ancient world, some kind of divine status could include mm -hmm. angels. Yeah. or a human king, or um, Alexander the Great claims some kind of divine status. But that's not the same as the divine status that early Christians attributed to God, the Father, or the triune God, or something like that. These were kind of quasi-divine. So an angel could be considered a god, or even a king could be considered a god. But it's important that we say a god and not the god, because in Christian terms, the god is only one, even if you accept the Trinity, that God is one uh, being in three persons, you're still insisting that it's one being and no human being can attain that status. But the sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of John, where he uses that Greek term, ego eimi, I am, uh, he seems to be echoing the Jewish scripture of where Yahweh says to Moses, Moses says, what shall I tell the Israelites? Uh, who, who told me to do this? And this voice from the bush says, you tell them I am uh, told you. Or at least that's the way it was interpreted. The, the interpretation of that in the Hebrew language is still somewhat debatable among scholars, yeah. but that's certainly what the Greek translation took it to be. So you tell them, ego eimi, I am is the God. So the Gospel of John is directly equalizing, e equating Jesus even in his pre-death, pre-resurrection human form to God the Father, to the God of Moses. And that's something we don't find any Jews doing. And for example, if you, you can take the, the writer, the his Jewish writer, Josephus. Mm. He relates many different stories about different messianic kinds of figures who claim to be a king after the kingship of David, or who claim to be uh, some, in some case divine in some way. Um, but they never equate themselves with the high God. Mm. And that's what you have the Gospel of John doing. So we just, I think that most people would just say, it's anachronistic to push back that very Christological, high Christological. In fact, you don't even have that in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. None of them equate God, uh, Jesus with God in a, in, as the highest God, the Father. They just don't. They call Jesus maybe God's son or a God or something like that. It's only the Gospel of John. That's one of the reasons we, we chronologically place the Gospel of John later is because we say this kind of 
doctrinal development took some time to develop. Uh, it didn't just spring right out from the mouth of Jesus. Mm. Another another example of the other end of the spectrum um, in Mark's gospel, a saying that's not uh, multiply attested, but nevertheless strikes you and many, if not vast majority of scholars as very highly probable to be authentic is um, a passage in the gospel of Mark chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, where a man comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There is no one good but God alone. And there Jesus seemingly denying that he is good and God, or by implication, denying he is God. Um, so that that would not that wouldn't be anachronistic then that would fit in with the cultural religious context of a first century early first century jew but it's not multiply a test well it maybe no it's not multiply a test is it because even though it's found in matthew and luke they modify it slightly well matthew does anyway but it's not found in john i don't think it's found in uh paul it's not found in thomas but but you think that is a, a really good candidate for an historically reliable um saying yes and Again, it kind of shows the illustration of these different uh, criteria we're talking about. It's early. It's in the Gospel of Mark, our earliest gospel source. Mm. Um, it, it is uh, also it, the criterion I haven't talked about, which this introduces, is the criterion of dissimilarity. Yeah, sorry, I haven't introduced that yet. But yeah, this is, maybe there's a good segue into the criteria of dissimilarity. The, yeah. the Gospel of Mark both ends but begins and ends, possibly, there's some debate about what the original manuscript said. The very first, you know, verses of Mark say, this is, a, this is the gospel, the good news of the beginning of uh, Jesus, son of God. Um, and then um, the centurion at the death of Jesus, when he sees how Jesus dies and the different miraculous events that surround Jesus' death, he says, even though he's a Roman centurion, he says, surely this man is a son of God or was a son of God. Now, again, notice that's a son of God, um, which would be a typical way of maybe referring to a very, very super holy man mm. or uh, a Messiah type figure or a king type figure. But that means that the Gospel of Mark may not have, the writer of the Gospel of Mark may not have been so indisposed to think of Jesus as divine. Mm -hmm. because there are still hints of the divinity of Jesus in the gospel of Mark. So the writer, but the writer still includes this apparent denial by Jesus that he is God or equivalent to God or even good. Or oh, even good. Yeah, this is amazing. Yeah. So uh, this seems to, this is what we say, the saying seems to be dissimilar to even the point of view of the writer of the gospel himself. And when you have a case like that, we have several others from different places, then uh, you say, well, this writer didn't invent it because it doesn't match his theology mm -hmm. completely. So he must have inherited it from someplace. Well, where did he inherit it from? He probably inherited it from people who were passing along this saying before him, from whom he learned as much as he knew about Jesus. So that's a very important a criterion is, when you find something in one of the Gospels or in the letters of Paul that seems to be somewhat dissimilar to their own theology, that has a better claim of being historical. Mm. That is going back to the historical Jesus. Just a slight detour for a second. Some scholars, I mean, Professor John Barton uh, from Oxford said on, on uh, Blogging Theology that Matthew's uh, own um, editing of that very passage, because Matthew, as you know, obviously used virtually all of Mark, gobbled it up virtually and edited it, and or not, as the case may be. He tweaks this statement of Jesus, why do you call me good, to have Jesus say, why do you ask me about what is good? And J John Barton thought that this was um, a less than honest move on Matthew's part to make Jesus' statement conform to late first century Christology rather than the actual saying he inherited. Would, yes. would, would that be a view you'd sympathize yes, with? Yes, I would share that with John. And and I say, I, I would point to that because John Barclay, I mean, he's a friend of mine. We've known each other. Mm. We're, we're the same age, basically. We've been in scholarship for about the same number of years. Um, and I've known him since we were both graduate students. Um, but he tends to be a bit more conservative than I about uh, what he will call the historical Jesus and not historical Jesus. In other words, mm. I... I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical sometimes 
mm. than he is about what I will take to be attributable to the historical Jesus. So if John Barclay is willing to say that that's, mm. um, that change by Matthew mm. is a fudging uh, on Matthew's part, then I think that shows that yeah, it, it was it was John Barton. Sorry, I, perhaps I misspoke. John Barton, who is the professor of Holy Scripture at the University of Oxford, he's a British um, New Testament scholar. Um, that's right. And he's, made, he's made an Old Testament scholar, I guess that's. But he's also obviously expert on the New Testament. And that even would strengthen my position more because John Barton is even more conservative than John Barclay. <laughs> yeah. so. in, in, indeed. No, I've noticed that the, the view you've expressed is is very common indeed, if not ubiquitous uh, amongst New Testament. Uh, scholars. So you, you briefly uh, and very eloquently, I think, uh, outlined the criteria um, I, I, that, that scholars, particularly in the 20th century, have used to uh, uncover or discover the historical Jesus. I, I note recently in the last 10, 20 years, there's been some disquiet amongst some scholars anyway about these criteria, perhaps not being uh, as reliable or as efficacious as uh, they were supposed to be. Uh, with perhaps of a greater emphasis on the the overall kind of thrust of a gospel's teaching so if mark has jesus talking about the kingdom of god repeatedly then that 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 kind of uh uh, uh very strong evidence or, or strong testimony counts as evidence for a generalized picture of who jesus really was if you see what i mean it is i mean what, what's what's been going on the last 20 years with scholars who seem to be turning or some turning against these criteria um for some reason well for some reason there yeah. are reasons <laughs> and yeah. one of the reasons is that you don't get tenure if you just say the same thing as everybody uh, else is saying. <laughs> okay so, interesting okay so you know part of the scholarship is all about revision and so there's a there's a there's a felt need among scholars to say something new and something different even if the new and different you're saying is something that people believed a hundred years ago also but you're just kind of bringing back some things. The most, one of the most famous scholars who's made the precisely the argument you're talking about is Dale Allison exactly. in, in his uh, very thick book. And I can't re recall the title of it, but. Um, is it about the resurrection, is it, or another one? No, it's about more the historical Jesus type. Uh, he's kind of attacking the whole historical yeah. method. And he precisely uh, does this thing of, um, saying the more find me somewhere so carry, carry on Sorry. the more uh, it is also somewhere in my house i am i assume but um uh, if since i've sold my practically my entire library i'm not sure i even have the book in the house anymore but it was a very important book in which he basically said no we need to throw these criteria out and just go with whatever occurs most yeah uh if a saying occurs in a, in a, bu a bunch of places a lot of times then that um but the way he gets there is by pointing out what all of us would admit, which is these criteria are not um, completely reliable. They're not like test tubes. Yeah, that you it's, not, it's not like a, it's not like physics or biology where you can actually yeah. repeat the experiment. The, 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 these are really the educated guesses, I suppose, if I can put it that way. And in fact, the 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 uh, the verbalizing of these criteria were secondary to their use by scholars in the 20th century. Hmm. Scholars started making different kinds of arguments for why they thought this was historical and that was not historical. And then it really was later, maybe in the 50s or 60s, that uh, scholars started actually giving these criteria names and labeling them and saying, okay, this is the criterion of dissimilarity. Or some people would call that in those days, the criterion of embarrassment because they would say no early Christian writer would invent a saying that would be an embarrassment to him uh, or sound I can sound less orthodox than he wanted to be. Now, a lot of us have not wanted to use that word criterion of embarrassment because it, it makes it a psychological issue. And we say it's not a psychological issue. It, it, it's a, a textual decision that you make about when you're comparing texts. Um, and so it's a, it's a scholarly discussion. It's not a discussion by Freud or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but these people have said, and Dale Allison made the, a lot of, most of his book is basically devoted to saying, um, to pointing out places where, well, this could be the case, but here are the reasons why it may not be the case. 
Well, careful scholars of the historical Jesus have always said, this is not an exact science. Any more, any more than any historiography is an exact science. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't tell you exactly what happened when Washington crossed the Delaware. You know, we can't, and that's why historians have arguments about it. But very few people would doubt that Washington crossed the Delaware and surprised the Hessian troops at Trenton. Uh, you know, they're just, history is always a matter of probabilities. And so these criteria are not set out as scientific proofs. There's, they're actually descriptions of what scholars have been doing for the last 100 years or so uh, and we just give labels to them. Um, but, uh, although I agree with you, Dale, I'm struck that when I read uh, you know, a diverse range of, of top New Testament scholars, say, you know, random example, you or uh, Tom Wright, or you mentioned Dale Allison, they, they all write with the confidence that this is the historical Jesus. And yet their conclusions, particularly Tom Wright, I mean, he's a very celebrated British scholar who's very well known in the United States and much loved in conservative Christian circles there as well. He's a real scholar. But you know, his reconstruction of Second Temple Judaism and the historical Jesus expressed with great eloquence and certainty, really, is so different from your reconstruction. Yes. And, and, and yet he would, you know, and, and so I'm wondering, you know, given this incredible difference, with, you know, almost as many Jesuses as there are biblical scholars, one wonders if these criteria are really so leaky and so kind of uh, 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 unable to produce a kind of general consensus that as to be uh, of questionable utility. Well, that's true. And uh, that's why when I teach this stuff in classes, uh, taught in classes, I'm now retired and haven't taught in years. But when I taught this stuff in classes, I always try to emphasize to my students that I'm trying to describe what is a um, an activity that scholars do. Mm. But that I try to say that you can you can use these methods, and you can use these ideas and come up with very different answers. Now, I also use the term, though, critical scholar, a critical scholar. Um, and, you know, people would say, well, that's a question begging kind of claim. You're just saying you're the critical scholar and these other people who disagree with you are not critical scholars. And I say, well, but there's a test for this. Um, my test for whether someone's historical Jesus is the result of critical scholarship is this. Does the end result of the scholarship match or not match that scholar's personal beliefs. So, for example, what you see with Tom Wright is that most of the time his Jesus matches a good conservative Anglican priest's Jesus. What a remarkable coincidence, Dale. How remarkable can you get? And what if you look at my historical Jesus, I consider myself also an Orthodox Anglican, although Episcopalian in my case, because I live in America, but I claim uh, the Anglican tradition is my own. I didn't grow up with it. I grew up as a fundamentalist, but I became a, an Episcopalian and I confess the Nicene Creed. I confess the Apostles' Creed. I'm a good Orthodox Christian in the Anglican tradition. But my historical Jesus doesn't match the Jesus I worship. No. And I think that is, that's what makes my construction a better critical construction of the historical Jesus, because I'm willing to criticize, I'm willing to place in the furnace um, my Christian faith and see what survives the fires of historical, historical study and see what doesn't. And I believe that if, a, if, a, if this is true of Paul, it's true. Do you, does your Paul end up looking like a good Southern Baptist if you are a Southern Baptist? Well, if that's the case, then you probably don't understand Paul very well, in my view. Because Paul right. wasn't a Southern Baptist. The one thing I'm sure, sure of, he was not a Southern Baptist. <laughs> exactly. Uh, if anything, Paul was a Calvinist, but even that's debatable. Oh, of course, he was a Calvinist. He was not a Southern Baptist. <laughs> Silly me. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, so that's what I would tell my students is that if you read something written by a modern scholar and you find out anything about the biography of that modern scholar, does he or she go to church? If so, what kind of church? Does he or say she profess 
uh, personal religious beliefs? If so, what kind of religious beliefs? And this is true of liberals as well as conservatives. I mean, there are, there are countless uh, liberal scholars who come up with a historical Jesus that remarkably look like modern liberal secular humanists. Um, and we could all name them. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they say, oh, gee, Jesus would never have talked like this, but he did t teach about the, uh, you know, the love of all humankind, the, he, his message was not doctrinal, it was ethical. And, but they also would deny that Jesus was preaching an imminent coming of the kingdom of God. Because, of course, that would mean that Jesus was wrong. Yeah. And so they deny an apocalyptic Jesus. And as I say, it's no accident that they deny an apocalyptic eschatological Jesus because they themselves are not apocalyptic eschatological Christians. Now, there's an example in your work which illustrates, I think, your own, if I can put it, your own critical integrity on this. Because uh, you, you write in uh, the book uh, New Testament History and Literature, which is basically a a written version of your Yale lectures to undergraduates, I think, yes. um, that Jesus is teaching uh, pro pro the probable historical Jesus taught quite an aesthetic um, moral code when it came to marriage and divorce. Um, I, he didn't approve of, he disapproved of divorce. And that's a really radical thing in the Judaism of his day where divorce was permitted uh, in Mosaic law, but he had a quite a, uh, a, but when it came to the practice of fellowship, uh, you know, he would hang out reputedly with prostitutes and uh, other, uh, you know, people who drank and, and had a good time partied and so on. So on the one hand, he was quite aesthetic and kind of, uh, what we could call say very conservative when it came to marriage. But on the other hand, in his socializing, he wasn't. But he also he wasn't a he wasn't advocating family values in the in the good old American sense of uh, um, traditional values because he seemed to have this kind of eschatological family. So it, whoever accepted his mission and his vision for God and God's rule would become his brother and sister and mother. And it actually says that in Mark, isn't it? But the point about the the, the sexual morality thing is because. Um, you, know, you, you don't subscribe to Jesus' ethic, clearly, in your own writings and your own views, but you have a different understanding. But your your historical reconstruction of Jesus was that he was very, very um, illiberal, if that's the right anachronistic word, when it ki came to matters like divorce and marriage. Um, so it, 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 what you're saying, re your critical reconstruction and your own theology and Episcopalianism are, are very distinct that they're, they're not you're, one is not servicing the other clearly unlike perhaps with people like tom wright where they are pretty much the same arguably yes I, for, but it's even more complicated than that because i believe that jesus did not advocate marriage ah. um which make which makes you think that okay if he didn't advocate marriage why wouldn't he allow divorce because he does say, you know, to his disciples that they should leave their their households and uh, these, and the, whether he said they should leave wives is debatable because it's not in all the sources. But it's multiply attested that when he called disciples, he told them to leave their households. And in some cases, it's and including their wives or when he says, unless you hate your mother and your father and your brother and sisters. And in one case, it says, and your wife, you have to hate your wife. Yes. Now, I don't think that means a guttural emotion of hatred. I think that means you despise those as things not worthy of your attention. But I can interrupt there, Dave. Christians, when I mention this to um, some Christians, they, they usually never believe that uh, Jesus actually said that, according to the Gospels. And it is actually there in Luke's Gospel, where in obviously the English translation of the Greek, <clears throat> Jesus is apparently, he is saying, unless you hate your parents and your wives and so on. He actually does say that and uh, people don't believe it because how can that be Jesus teaching? But it's in the gospel, at least That's one. Right. Of them. So on the one hand, you have Jesus demanding that his disciples leave their households and in some cases leave and even leave their wives. Mm. And Jesus never advocated uh, childbearing. Never, mm. never. Nor did Paul. Um, Paul, Paul also was not really for marriage. And yet both Paul and Jesus were against divorce. Hmm. Now, it just doesn't seem that those fit together very well. No, no. The fact that they don't fit together very well is an argument for their historicity. Yeah. 
because it's not a neat, uh, plausible kind of scenario someone's creating. It's kind of, it has that awkwardness and contradictoriness that reality has sometimes. Exactly. Um, so in spite of the fact that both Paul and Jesus forbade divorce, mm. neither of them advocate, they, neither of them were fans of marriage and family. Mm, mm. But you would have thought that they would have advocated divorce if they were not proponents of marriage and family. Mm. And yet neither of them do. Mm. No. So it's, it's complicated, but I think that very complications of the position render it more likely historical. Yeah, yeah, because because real life is not tidy and neat and or all. Yeah, real life is paradoxical, and uh, yeah, that, I, I see I see your point. So who? So coming perhaps to the question. Who was the historical Jesus? Now, I know there's a lot of caveats about it. You know, the historical Jesus is the construction by modern historians according to modern historiographical rules. I, I get that. But as far as we, we can peer back through our sources, leaving out the anachronisms, leaving out the, the secondary things, leaving out the clearly made up stories, what emerges from that? Is it, um, and in the light of Mark 10, verse 17 and 18, why do you call me good? No one's good but God alone. What kind of, what kind of person is Jesus according to historical reconstruction? Okay, I put my glasses on because I thought you might ask this question. And I knew I would not be able to remember it from the top of my head. But do you mind if I just read you a list of things? Please. That I think can be said about the historical Jesus and defend yeah. it. And then we, it, then we can come back and talk about any of them uh, that you want. First, Jesus was a disciple of John the Baptist. Ah, yes, indeed. That's very because he was baptized by John the Baptist. He therefore, he was John the Baptist. coordinate to John the Baptist. Also, this this fits the criterion of dissimilarity because yeah. all the Gospels who talk about Jesus' baptism by John deny that he was a disciple of John. <laughs> yeah, they say he went to John to please God's will or some other reason, but they try to. They try to poo-poo his, his baptism by John. So that means it's almost certainly a historical. Also, several of Jesus' closest disciples were former disciples of John the Baptist. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, a, good one. that's a good one. Yeah. That also means that Jesus, and this goes with a lot of his sayings, I say he was an apocalyptic Jewish prophet. He wasn't a Greek philosopher. He wasn't a Christian theologian. That means that he was Jewish to the core, and he was announcing the imminent coming of the kingdom of God on earth and right. heaven. So, uh, I think he was generally uneducated. Uh, there's so no was a, a lower class Galilean peasant. Lower type. class Galilean. And there was no Galilean yeah. high school, no Galilean university where youngsters were. Not went formally, no. Century that we know no. of. No. Just thought I said um, no. he, was, his, he was executed by the Romans on the charge of treason and rebellion. He appointed 12 disciples. Also, that 12, the number 12 is important because why 12? Well, this, this is where the eschatological Jesus come back then. We believe that he chose the number 12 because in the gospel, it says these will be the 12 judges of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the 12 tribes of Israel did not exist in Jesus' day, mm, no. except in the minds of Jews. Yeah, so yeah. Jesus must have believed that the Messiah came he would reconstitute Israel into 12 tribes and his 12 chosen disciples would be the heads of each of these 12 tribes. Right. Um, he was a healer and a miracle worker. That's just all over the place. So no need to deny it. We don't know. We don't need to show, we don't need to say that he actually worked miracles. Uh, we can just say he was known in his time to be a healer and a miracle worker. Yeah. His mother was Mary. Mm -hmm. He had a brother named James. Probably his father was Joseph. Uh, he taught Jewish wisdom kinds of sayings. Uh, he taught in parables and sayings, not in lengthy sermons like the Gospel of John. Galilee was his base. And that's where he started his ministry. He was in Jerusalem at the end of his life. He was born in Nazareth, not Bethlehem. Uh, he taught love as a central commandment. I think that's indisputable that the love, the, the dual commandment of loving God and loving the neighbor uh, encapsulated all of the Jewish law. He spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, not Greek, and certainly not Latin, as you would believe from the Gospel of John. 
or English. I thought I'd just say that because some people think, you know, the Jesus spoke in King James Version English. He didn't. Yeah, when I was growing up in fundamentalist church, I would, people would say, well, if the King James Version was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough yeah. for me. It's a great saying, one of the greatest. Yeah. And, and then the, the last thing is, as I, I said before, um, he did not seek to found a religion. He sought to announce and maybe compel there's certain places where I think there's evidence that he was trying to force God's hand. Why did he go to Jerusalem at the end of his life? Well, I wrote an article one time that said Jesus had come to believe that he, if he didn't force God to send the Messiah and overthrow the Romans, it wasn't going to happen. And that's why he committed what he did in the temple by overturning the tables and, and causing a ruckus. He didn't really think that he could overthrow the Romans, but I think he saw himself as a prophetic figure like Isaiah or Jeremiah, and they would do these, uh, you know, theatrical acts in Jerusalem right. to, to illustrate their prophetic mission, but also sometimes to force God to act. Yeah. And so I think that's what he was about, not founding a religion, not founding a church. Now, those are just a list of a few things that I think are incontrovertibly um, I, I noticed you left one out. Well, one that I, I would, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I personally think, and that is Jesus, the law observant Jew. Uh, it seems to me that he didn't come to abolish the law and someone else might have said that, but he actually obeyed the law. Yes, he interpreted it in a way that was in accordance with his understanding. You mentioned love. So that might have been different from, say, how allegedly some of the Pharisees or the Sadducees understood it. But does not the early evidence suggest that he nevertheless obeyed the law? Yes, he interpreted it in his own way. And is that not a key date in him as well? Yes, I think that is key. But you have to be very careful about that because um, Jesus was not a Sadducee for sure because mm. he believed in the resurrection. The yeah. Sadducees did not. Yeah. Jesus was not a Pharisee. And it's because he didn't accept a lot of what people then would, some scholars would call the traditions of the fathers, the hand-washing incidents and those kinds of things. Jesus did not teach his disciples to wash their hands before they ate. Jesus did not teach his disciples initially uh, particular forms of prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are things that separate him from the, Jesus was not an Essene, a member of like the Qumran community. He was much more, in our terms, liberal in his interpretation of the law. That's why I think that Jesus uh, believed that <laughs> Ethics basically could be interpreted by the, the guide of the love commandment. Um, and, and I think that's undoubtedly uh, goes back to the historical Jesus, which means that he could be quite um, free in his interpretation of what the law said or what the law required. And I think that's probably right. And that's what got him into trouble with at least uh, the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. But but some scholars have said that uh, uh, despite what you say, uh, he he was more liberal in some ways and so on. But it was still within the the boundaries of the, the, the in, intra Jewish discourse about how yes, to yes, yes. In fact, the law. He didn't yes. step outside of that and say, no, the the Torah now, forget it. We're going to follow some some other path. No, no. That in fact, Jesus would not have been even the most uh, liberal in his interpretations just comparing to Philo of Alexandria, who just basically used allegory yeah. to get around most of what the Torah said. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Phi Jesus would have looked conservative in the same room with Philo. Of oh. course, Philo, Philo was also a Greek-educated philosopher. Yeah, he was a Hellenistic Jew. He wasn't kind of, and he, he, he did speak Greek, unlike Jesus. <laughs> he yeah. wrote in Greek, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so Jesus was uh, a Jewish prophet like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, and he, he even enacted uh, his message like those prophets did in slightly different ways. He didn't take off his clothes or anything like that, which is one of them did. And he didn't walk around naked for three yeah. years like Isaiah did. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't believe Jesus did that. And um, uh, but, but nevertheless, there was an apocalyptic or eschatological sort of uh, accent or, or t um, orientation to his uh, his preaching which uh, again fits in with the early church with paul his early letters one thessalonians which is very apocalyptic uh, in its tone uh, unlike much later letters attributed to him like one and two timothy and titus and even paul uh, sorry uh, john rather which is 
seems that whole apocalyptic fervor and expectation seems to have been toned down or even absent. Um, exactly. And the other thing you can do, it, it helps to compare Jesus with other figures we know from the same period. So as I said, he started off as a disciple of John the Baptist, mm. but he was not as rigid as John the Baptist when it came to, you know, behaviors like ascetic behavior. I don't think he was as ascetic as John the Baptist. And maybe that was one of the reasons Mm. that um, he separated himself out from John the Baptist movement. Mm. Jesus, Jesus never denied that he liked a good drink every once in a while, you know, liked wine and hung around with sinners. That doesn't look like John the Baptist, you know, who walked around and, apart from the cities and wore camel's hair and ate locusts. Um, not, not a great diet. I wouldn't recommend that diet today. I really wouldn't recommend <laughs> And you've got lots of ketchup, perhaps. I think. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, um, okay, I, I've got to ask the obvious question. And I, I know this is a separate discussion and it's not the purpose of uh, your uh, contribution today. But I've got to notice, I've got to say it, that what you've said speaks of much discontinuity between the historical Jesus, for example, not founding a church, not founding a new religion, preaching the kingdom of God. Uh, having a non-Eucharistic Last Supper, and so on and so on. Why do you call me good? No one's good by God alone. All these indicate pretty fundamental discontinuities between all that and the later Christian faith of the creeds and the councils of the church. Um, now, this gap seems like a chasm, and and I know this is not the point of this discussion, but I, I just note that it exists, and, and I know you have, uh, if viewers want to read a, uh, Dale Martin's own um, discussion of precisely this theme, biblical truths, the meaning of scripture in the 21st century. You do discuss these issues uh, in great depth, I know. Um, that's a separate discussion. But would you have any uh, initial at least comments on this, what I'm calling a gap or discontinuity between these two? Well, I, I think that uh, when I, I didn't come to be a Christian by doing historical research. I became a Christian uh, for whatever reasons. I mean, people say, well, why do you believe? And I'll say, well, do you want my own kind of biological, uh, you know, autobiographical answer or do you want a theological answer? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the theological answer I would say is, I don't know. God gave me the miracle of the gift of faith. And, uh, but, but historically, you know, you have to say, well, what were you, when you, you know, decided you wanted to remain, become a Christian or remain a Christian. Now, see, I didn't really become a Christian in the sense because I was raised in a Christian home, yeah. had Christian parents and grandparents, and, you know, I was raised in the church. And so uh, I just never saw any need to reject that and turn my back on that completely. Now, a lot about it I have rejected. I'm gay, for example, and uh, I, I don't have any desire to be married even to another man. And so there are several different aspects about the traditional church that I don't accept, but uh, it never led me to believe that the whole thing had to be thrown out. In fact, I just always believed that my life would be much impoverished if I threw it all out. Um, so when I go to church, I'm living out that aspect of my life that yeah. came to me through faith. And it was only after being a Christian of faith that um, I learned what these historiographical tools and I started trying to apply them to uh, the Bible first to the Bible just to the text what can we say about the text in its most original meaning by the authors who the human authors who wrote it and then what can we say about the historical Jesus but um, whenever I went into that I I didn't do that um, with the end result that that those results caused me to lose my faith I, th I just think that means that these two parts of my brain don't operate completely as one. Um, and, and I, t I treat that actually, I'm a postmodernist, as you know, and I treat uh, language and belief systems and cultural systems as discourses. Mm -hmm. And certain discourses only make sense within the discourse with which you provide them, within you assume them. The example I've given many times is, um, if I say to someone, would you close for me? Well, what does that mean? Well, if I'm a lawyer in a court and I turn to one of my co, you know, defend, defendant lawyers and I say, 
okay, would you close for me? I'm meaning, would you close the case for me? Because I've done a lot of interrogating and you can just close. So you close the case, wrap it up. If I'm a doctor in an operating room, I say to a nurse, would you close for me? Or to a, an attending physician. And everybody knows what that means. You suture up the wound, you clean it all up, you, you close for them. Um, if I say it in a, in a store, when I, I'm saying to one of my coworkers in a, in a store somewhere, would you close for me? That means I usually lock up, but I have to go to a meeting. Would you close the store down for me? In other words, would you close for me has absolutely no meaning on its own. And so when it says, when I say, I believe in Jesus Christ, son of God, that only makes sense for me in a Christian context. In a, as a confession of faith. I can't say that as a historian because h- historical mm. discourse is simply a different discourse. It has different rules. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's very similar to speaking more than one language. You know, I was, I've been fluent in Spanish and French and Italian and German at different times in my life. Currently, I can just barely speak Spanish and German and I've forgotten all the others. But anybody who's learned more than one language knows that when somebody says, well, what do you mean when you say da, 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 da? And sometimes you just have to say, I don't think I can say that in English. It mm. means about this, but it's about that. It's not exactly that. And in fact, in order to tell you what I mean by it, I have to give you a context of why would a Spanish speaking person say this? Um, do, I can think of words, ojalá, uh, you know, the word ojalá. What does ojalá mean? Well, it kind of means if, it, if only it were so, or God willing, but you don't have to believe in God to say God willing or oh, Allah, because the word God willing, the words God willing said in just a normal conversation do not imply faith necessarily. Well, what language is that, by the way? I wasn't familiar with that expression. Spanish. Spanish. Oh, right, Spanish. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, gonna, it's an, an expression that I've remember just hearing a lot in my life, but um, I could be saying that and be totally wrong and forgetting which language I got it out of, but there are just all kinds of fragments of languages in my head Mm -hmm. and um, they don't mean anything in translation, in strict translation. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way I believe about statements of faith in a context of faith. And for me, it's not a context of just noumenal faith, like faith in some kind of grand meaning of the universe. It's, it's a faith that's rooted in the Christian narrative and Christian sources. Mm. <clears throat> now, I, I can say I believe in God the Father, and then I have to explain, well, I don't really think God is a father. Mm. So what would it mean when I say I confess God the Father? Well, it may even mean something that any Buddhist would say, which is that God is simply a tag we put onto the question of why is there meaning in the universe? It's just a word that fills a gap in what we can't explain. And but, but, but just to challenge that for a second, I mean, historically in the creeds, when they have been discussed by you know the, the great and the good, like St. Thomas Aquinas or Augustine or Anselm and so on, th- there was a quite, quite a lot of metaphysical content. It wasn't just a tag. It, you know, th- they used the language of Greek philosophy, uh, you know, Aristotelian philosophy in, in Aquinas' sense to really give substance, you know, pun intended, by the way, uh, substance to uh, these tags. So they're not quite as free floating uh, as, as, as your description of this implies. Surely if, if one is going to have the creeds, one must have that, that, have that content understanding as well. They're not just free floating words. They, they have that substance. Well, that, I, I would challenge you on that, especially with Thomas Aquinas. Okay. Because, yes, there, Thomas always talked out of both sides of his mouth. It's even the way he constructed his book, right? Mm, yeah. His books were like, here's a thesis, here's an antithesis, and then how um, can we, you know. Yep. And so Thomas will talk that way sometime. But it's more like my former colleague at Yale, Dennis Turner, who oh, is. Yeah. A, a, yeah. yeah. He's a Thomist and he's a Catholic and. Yeah. He's a philosopher, and uh, he's I've a. Got I've got his book on Th- Thomas Aquinas. It's a brilliant book. I really yes. like uh, mm. you know, Dennis would believe that Thomas would agree with him when they say things like, and I'm not sure Dennis actually said this verbatim like this, but he he would say something like this: 
The statement God is simply proves that we know nothing about what we mean by God or is. In other words, it's negative theology. It's the idea that everything we say about God as an attribute of God is false. It may be true in a sense, but it's also false in a sense. That's yeah. why when I published that book, biblical, uh, my biblical theology was called Biblical Truths. Mm -hmm. I wanted to call it in a sense. Yeah, okay. Over and over in that book, I say, well, this is true in a sense. Yeah. But it's also false in a sense. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way Christian theology is when you put it in that long tradition. And I would include Augustine in this. Mm -hmm. I would include Aquinas in this. And I would even include some, Paul in some of his things because Paul is much clearer about how we don't know what we we don't know what we're saying when we talk about God. Mm -hmm. um, there there are passages from Paul that would be easily interpreted to support that Thomistic saying. Um, so I would I would say that my way of talking about Christian faith as being susceptible to historical inquiry, but not identifiable with historical conclusions hmm. is something that Thomas would agree with. And I know it's something that many modern theologians would agree with. And besides my former colleague, Dennis Turner, I could cite my former colleague, Catherine Tanner, who's published extensively on this topic too. I notice you quote her in your, in your work as well. Yes. Um, okay, well, perhaps in, in conclusion, then we've been chatting for uh, over an hour. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, what would you want people to understand about the historical Jesus uh, in listening to your discussion here? What, what's the takeaway, do you think, for people? Um, honesty is a virtue. And if you want to play the game of history, and I admit it's a game of history, history does not render to you absolute truth mm. it gives you a product but if you want to play the game of history play it honestly pay back play by its rules in other words if you want to construct a historical jesus and here again i would insist i mean construct a historical jesus mm. you're not finding the historical jesus well that's it that's an important point because the historical jesus is not except you know, the actual real flesh and blood jesus and other is not accessible to us radically not accessible 2000 years ago we we you know we're, we're into you know we have but so what historians do is they construct a story i guess based on various principles and rules they, can, they construct a portrait um they paint a portrait and they use their imagination but if you're going to do it you have to use historical the, the rules of a historian and play by the rules which means for example don't try to construct a historical Jesus in a way that you would differently from um, a historical Julius Caesar. Um, a good historian will never say that Julius Caesar was raised to the level of divinity on, upon his death. Historians just won't say that or they'd never get tenure. And so Christian scholars should stop saying things like that in Christian universities too, they're not playing the historical game by the rules. They're shifting the rules. That's why I say honesty is a virtue. Play the game of history honestly, playing by the rules of normal secular historians, historians who don't have a case to prove when it comes to Jesus' divinity or Jesus' miracles or Jesus walking on water or anything like that. Now that means you're not gonna get again jesus as he actually was in history because that's inaccessible to us and of course the jesus as he actually was in real history from a christian point of view would be the son of god in the divine sense that's your your, your view isn't it because it's not as historian now you're, you're saying because the real jesus is inaccessible to historians We've, you've established that well, so, what I, my, the way I'd put it is just to say, see, you're kind of putting it into a, a metaphysical, ontological statement. Yes. Jesus in history was the son of God. Yeah. That, that, inex, that, that inaccessible Jesus, not the Jesus of, of construction, but the Jesus, the real Jesus, as you would call him. 
but th there's no real Jesus. That's what I'm trying to say. There are only the Jesus of faith or the Jesus of history. There's no real Jesus. I see. I see. It's according to which discourse you're talking about. As a Christian, I say, of course, the real Jesus is the divine Jesus. The, and the second, I would even go further than that, the second person of the Trinity. Mm, mm. Fully, fully, and also of two natures, fully human and fully divine. But all of that is taking the Jesus as Jesus came to be in the creeds of the church. Now, if someone says to explain, why do I do that? I think, well, I, I have a part of my faith is believing that what became Christian doctrine didn't exist in the year 30 in Palestine. No. It developed. Well, what makes me a Christian is that I believe that the Holy Spirit led the church into fuller truths that didn't exist in the, for humans in the year 30. In other words, later developments of Christian faith are themselves divine developments. They are led by the providence of God. Mm. But it makes no sense as a historian to say that the Nicene Creed is true because it was led by the providence of God. It's not that you can't say that. It just doesn't make any sense to say that in the context of historical research. But is it not the case that you, the human being, the, the holistic Dale Martin, if I can put it that way, uh, believe that the real Jesus, I'm not talking about the historical reconstruction, the real Jesus, which we don't have access to, nevertheless for you, was the second person of the Trinity? I don't believe in using the word real. That's part of the pro uh, problem. Uh, By putting the word real in there, you're shifting back to an ontological monism. What's wrong with ontology? I mean, ontology, metaphysics. Nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong with ontology. It's an ontological monism. It's the idea that once you actually find out the true nature of something, it's got to be one thing. Yeah. And not and that's, what I'm, that's what I'm debating. Oh, I see. This is it, a philosophical issue, really, isn't it? It's not, yeah, okay. Um, now, the, the word ontology just refers to how do you think about the nature of being? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we can talk about that all day long, and there's nothing wrong with ontological discussions like that. But if you think an ontological discussion is going to get you to the real being of the thing, that's when you're mistaken. But I thought that's what Christian faith required belief in, the ontology of Jesus being fully God, fully man, second person of the Trinity. That's an ontological statement, a metaphysical claim about a mind-independent reality. So it's not something from our heads. That's actually that's, objectively. That's the Christian claim. Exactly. But it's not the historical claim. Uh, indeed. But I'm saying, uh, that's why I said that for, for Dale Martin, the holistic, you know, because you are not, you are not an historian. That is not your complete identity. Uh, your historical uh, acumen and knowledge is a facet of that, but you are more than that. But your ultimate, I, I guess I'm trying to say, does not your Christian perspective trump cr historical criticism at the end of the day? No, there are, two, there are two different realms of discourse. Okay. They're, notice they're not two different realms of reality. We don't have access to reality. We only have access to language. Oh, right. it, what you're trying to do is push me to talking about the true nature of reality. Yes. And the whole point of this is to say, we do not have access to reality. We have access to language. Now, we can choose to live in one language or live in another language. Mm. It, it's, it's, again, let's bring up language. You can say that there's French and there's English, but neither, but you couldn't take French and English and just force them into each other so that you get um, a non-linguistic real. It, it doesn't exist unless as a Christian you say, well, the only real that is real is God. And then you have to fall back on negative theology again and say, yeah, and we don't know what that is. And we can't know what that is. When we say God is real, we just prove we don't know what the words God is and real mean. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay. It's postmodern because it, it absolutely turns its back on the idea <clears throat> that there's a single discourse, say mm. history or science or theology or whatever, yeah. 
that in itself can can hand you reality on a platter. Yeah. There's no such thing. That doesn't mean that they're not different realities. Although uh, although a, a, a wag or a cynic might say that that very definition of postmodernism refutes itself because it is that that postmodern definition about ultimate reality is a statement about ultimate reality, that it cannot be defined. You know what I mean? It's like saying all truth is relative. Well, that statement itself is a statement of absolute truth. No, that again, that again it, uses, it uses a false ontological equation to make a clever rhetorical point because the postmodern position doesn't say there's no reality. It just says we don't have access to it. And that's that's just a personal historical statement. Just saying I've tried through a lot of different methods to find out what the truth with a cop capital T for all of the universe means. And I can't get there. And I've done enough of it to believe that you can't get there either, at least with the languages we have now. Now, it also is open to uh, the future. It may say maybe humanity will discover some kind of language that really is the eternal Hebrew. We just don't know what it is yet. But if you believe that there's one language, whether it's history or science or religion or whatever, that can give, that is the true language of reality, you're just back to, you know, the beginning of before modernity, when they said, well, the true language of all truth is Hebrew. Mm. And I if we just, translate everything into Hebrew, we would get to true reality. Mm. I think mean, this is going off the subject. I was just say uh, as a kind of footnote, uh, I, I was very impressed with the way Immanuel Kant deals with the, the difficulties of empiricism and rationality in, in, in providing uh, enduring certain scientific epistemology and his solution in the critic of pure reason to do with synthetic a priori categories and statements. Um, I, I just was blown away by that. And, you know, he does actually advance beyond the a priori into synthetic truths when he talks about the categories of space and time and causality and so on. And that that does seem to um, advance. I mean, obviously, we can't know Newman and things in themselves, but nevertheless, he, he does seem to move into objective, objective uh, knowledge, objective ontology or epistemology in a way which isn't at tension with where you're characterizing the postmodern world but that's a very different subject but uh that's why i'm also i'm very keen on plato so i mean I'm, just to throw a name in you know mm -hmm. <laughs> enough said you know um maybe that's a an emotional preference rather than an intellectual one i don't know mm -hmm. but um all, all that's is several red herrings all over the place there i mean yeah exactly <laughs> going over there um all right um professor dale martin uh it's been an absolute pleasure um and thank you so much for explaining so eloquently and succinctly um the criteria that historians use to uncover the historical jesus what that means the historical jesus and also what he historically speaking um most likely was about not founding a new religion you know uh, being an apocalyptic prophet and so on it's very very instructive um and uh, i've already mentioned it several times but the, if you want to pursue the the uh the themes that dale has uh, articulated particularly about postmodernism and how to read the bible in the world that we live today uh biblical truths is certainly the go-to book it's got some rave reviews from uh, a couple of professors at oxford and durham university Loyola university in the states as well so it's well received by the academic community as well so thank you very much dale um i believe we we will meet again one more time to talk about christian the the faith beyond the new testament we'll come to that maybe another time but uh okay uh, Thank you so much. And um, I'll end it there. And um, but to stay on, I'm going to end the broadcast. But if we could just stay on for a second. So thank okay. you until next time. All right.